Professor Robert Sedler on the Constitution and Gay Marriage. So, Professor Sedler really needs an introduction to this, um, to this forum because um, Professor Sedler is one of the very best supporters of this uh, that I could, uh, could ask for. I think every year since 2005, he has uh, graced the, the program as his uh, presence. Just having his name on, my, on the schedule gives it, um, gives it uh, considerable prestige. And every year I hold my breath and I hope that uh, Professor Sedler signs up. And this year he did it again. And uh, this is going to be his third talk on this particular topic. Uh, constitution and gay marriage equality. Uh, for those uh, students who are here, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about Professor Silver. Um, he is a distinguished professor of law at Wayne State University right here. Uh, he teaches courses in constitution and law and conflict of laws. Prior to coming to Wayne State University in 1977, he was professor of law at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. Uh, he received his AD degree from the University of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh in 1956 and his GAD from the same university. Uh, he is a member of Phi Beta Kappa and the Order of Coif. Uh, in 2005, he was elected to the Wayne State University Academy of Scholars which is the highest recognition that could be bestowed upon a faculty member by their colleagues. Uh, he served as president of the first body during the 2007-2008 academic year. He has published extensively in both of his fields, and there have been many citations of his work by courts and by academic commentators. In 1994, he published a book on American constitutional law for the International Encyclopedia of Laws. That book was updated and republished in 2000, and then again updated and republished in 2005, and then again updated and republished in 2010. So that tells you how important that book is. But Professor Sedler has initiated a large number of civil rights and civil liberty cases in Michigan, Kentucky, and elsewhere mostly as a volunteer lawyer for the ACLU. The cases he has litigated in Michigan include the Devon Park case, the racial discrimination in adoption and forced care case, a challenge to the suspicionless drug testing for welfare recipients. He's also a member of the Social Action Commission of the Union for Reform Judaism and a member of its amicus brief committee. He was named uh, this, uh, Gersonson Distinguished Faculty Fellow at Green State in 1985-87, and received the Daniel H. Gordon Award for Excellence in Teaching in, in 1988. In 2000-2005, he held the Gibbs Chair in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, He's also um, received awards from the NAACP in Kentucky, the ACLU in Kentucky, the NAACP, the Metropolitan De Detroit branch, the Southwest Michigan ACLU, the Metropolitan Detroit ACLU, and the Oakland County ACLU. And he was the chairperson of the Michigan State Bar Constitutional Law Committee in 1981, from 1981 to 1987, and the Legal Education Committee from 1988 to 1994. I can go on and on and on, but I think you get the picture that you're in the presence of a distinguished uh, legal scholar who has taken time from his uh, amazingly busy schedule to come and talk to us today on the Constitution and the Constitution and marriage equality. So please give an enthusiastic welcome to the podium to Professor Robert Sender. Thank you, Dr. Well, I'm sure to be here. 
Good morning. Come around. Come around. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here and deal with humanists and to deal in an academic setting. And I found I've learned a lot from these meetings, some of which have been reflected in my work. In many ways, to discuss this subject, I've signed up for about a half dozen speeches this year. Uh, but I'm going to put it in context with these groups. And because this is an academic group, I want to try to approach it the way academics do, at least what I consider an academic, more academic perspective. The first time I talked about this was before this group, and the date was September 28, 2004. That's a long time ago. And we called it same-sex marriage. And Dr. Edwards used the term gay marriage. Uh, words mean something, because words convey something. And in the course of discussing this, writing about it, and litigating it, our, the use of the term has evolved. We quit in our briefs. We did not use the term anymore, same-sex marriage. We used the term marriage for same-sex persons. That nuanced change is significant because it's always been our position that marriage is a legal relationship based on love and commitment and that all the reasons that make marriage very important for opposite-sex couples are equally applicable to same-sex couples. State is simple. Simply, when it comes to marriage, there's no difference between an opposite-sex couple and a same-sex couple. So that's why we changed the term to marriage for same-sex persons. Equality means just that, that people are treated the same. It doesn't mean they're treated well or treated badly. It just means that they're treated the same. I want to, I still have the announcement in 2004, and I want to read from it, uh, if I may. Professor Sedler maintains that as a matter of policy and constitutional law, same-sex persons should have the same right to marry that the law provides for opposite-sex persons. And I said the argument is based on Supreme Court decisions <laughs> invalidating as arbitrary and irrational legal discriminations on the basis of sexual orientation, such as a Texas law prohibiting oral or anal sex by same-sex persons, and a Colorado state constitutional provision prohibiting the inclusion of sexual orientation discrimination in state and local anti-discrimination laws. These cases hold that governmental discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation cannot be justified on the basis of societal prejudice or morality. And Professor Sedler argues that once these purported justifications are removed, there can be no valid or rational justification for denying same-sex persons the right to marry that the law provides for opposite-sex persons. Therefore, he maintains that state laws denying same-sex persons the right to marry violate the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection of the laws. <coughs> and so that was the position that I took in a law review article back in 2004. And over the years, I've given various speeches and presentations in various venues, basically with the same theme, that there's no difference when it comes to the fundamental right of marriage between same-sex couples and opposite-sex couples. All the benefits that we see in marriage for opposite-sex couples are equally applicable to same-sex couples. So, that's the first academic point I want to make. The second one is that for those of us who are in academic life, we get great satisfaction from the success of our students. And I have been fortunate to be able to become involved with students of mine many years 
after they left law school, especially when they come to me and say, can you work with me on something that I want to do? And that is the story of the case of DeBoer versus Snyder. April DeBoer and Jane Rouse are two nurses. They work at inner city hospitals. They've been together. When we filed this case, it was for over 10 years. They had a commitment ceremony. And they adopted special needs children. I mean special needs almost to the point of death. If you could see these children at the adoption ceremony last week, you would see one or now two weeks ago. Five, five and six year olds, I believe, thriving, part of a family. But Michigan law allowed a single person to adopt, but would not allow an unmarried couple to adopt. The result was that although Jane and April were parenting these children together, they couldn't be their co-parents. For those of us who are married with children, we've always taken co-parenting for granted. What if, heaven forbid, something would happen to one of us? Well, the other person is there to be the parent because the law provides for a married couple who are both equal parents. But if you're unmarried, there's no right. For all you know, a stranger to do it. April and Jane were almost involved in an automobile accident. And they realized that if something happened to one of them, who knows who would get custody and control of the child. They wanted to adopt both children. They came to Dana Nessel, class of 1994, along with another lawyer, a friend of hers, Carolyn Stanier. They tried to get relief in the Michigan courts. They were unsuccessful. Michigan law is very clear. Only a married couple can adopt. We can't make any exceptions. So in the summer of 2011, Dana and Carol came to me and said, is there a way we can put a constitutional challenge to the ban on second parent adoption for an unmarried couple? That is, this case, even though it ended up being about marriage for same-sex couples, was really about adoption for same-sex couples. So let me, again, approach that as I did an academic. Take, for example, a woman is divorced, she has custody of the children, she remarries, the man is willing to adopt her children, and the biological father is willing to terminate parental rights so he won't have to support the kids anymore. That's wonderful. The children will now have two parents, and the courts facilitate a second parent adoption. And that was the example that I used in a piece that I wrote about 2003 about Sam, hypothetical Sam, whose divorced mom marries a man, and the man, the man adopts Sam, and Sam now has two parents. Samantha's mom, after her divorce, realizes that her sexual orientation is lesbian. She has children, she has a new partner, and the partner wants to adopt her children so Samantha can have two parents and the biological father is willing to terminate parental rights. No, you can't do that because they are a lesbian couple. They, here's with a double whammy. It's a truly catch-22 if you've read that book. Uh, they can't, you can't adopt unless you're, you marry, and you can't marry, so you can't adopt, and Samantha doesn't have two parents while Sam does. So I'd written in a law review article that this violates equal protection, same way as discrimination against out-of-wedlock children. These children are denied a second parent because of prejudice against who their parents, who the parents would be. So we brought the suit in federal court, came before Judge Bernard Friedman, and our main contention was that the ban on second parent adoption for an unmarried couple violates equal protection. April and Jane also allege that they wanted to marry and would marry if they could, but they couldn't. 
But from their standpoint, getting married was secondary to having two parents for their children. Uh, Dana and Carol asked me to present that argument, uh, which I, they were not experienced yet. They became as the case went on. And so I made the argument, Judge Friedman wasn't buying it. Either it was because he believed that you shouldn't allow an unmarried couple to adopt, or because he wanted to push us to challenge the ban on, a, on marriage for same-sex people, or both. He says, you're really challenging the ban on marriage. Now, I'm not telling you what to do, but you might want to amend your complaint to uh, allege that it's a challenge, that, which we did. Uh, we're back to my 2004 Law Review article. There's no rational reason to distinguish between same-sex couples and opposite-sex couples when it comes to marriage. Uh, uh, opponents say, well, well a, an opposite-sex couple, uh, a same-sex couple can't procreate. They can't have children, they can't biologically have children together. Well, one, marriage has nothing to do with procreation. When people apply for a marriage license, we don't make them sign, we will procreate children. And indeed, we allow people to marry when they're way beyond the age of procreation. Having children is wonderful, but marriage is separate from having children. Indeed, things have changed in today's world. 40% of babies are born to unmarried women. Many women feel they can enter upon parenthood without having a husband. Okay, now. Uh, that's the first. Also, why do people procreate? Not for the sense of procreate. They want to be able to be parents. And there are other ways to become parents. Certainly uh, in today's world with assisted reproductive technology, uh, if you have an infertile man, uh, the woman can become pregnant by uh, artificial insemination. Uh, many couples adopt. Then there's surrogate parenting, if you have an infertile woman and a fertile man. So there are many children out there who weren't gestated by the conventional biblical means of procreation. And so when the state made an argument that children thrive best when they have two biologically related parents, one asks, what about all the children who are adopted, the children produced by artificial insemination, surrogate parenting, and so forth. Uh, the cases were, when we d developed our argument, it was basically there's no rational reason why the state should refuse to license marriage between a same-sex couple. Now, I want to use the word license. We have always required people to get a license to marry because there are various restrictions on marriage. Uh, you can only have one uh, spouse at a time uh, in this country. Uh, there are certain limitations on uh, what we call uh, consanguinity and uh, biology. Uh, fit, that is, you can't marry certain relatives. Uh, siblings can't marry. There used to be a lot more restrictions. There are fewer, uh, but we do require a license because marriage is a legal relationship. There are some couples, now I'm talking about heterosexual, opposite sex couples, who say, well, we're just going to live together, or we're not going to have a piece of paper, our love is enduring, and so forth. And that's fine. But if you're not married, you miss an awful lot of legal benefits. And if you have children, your children are denied all those benefits and they're denied the ability to talk about their parents. Whether it's two mommies or two daddies or one mommy or one daddy, a lot of children have two parents and they are married to each other. One of the things that's, that came out so clearly here is that the harm that's caused to same-sex couples and their children by not being able to marry. 
Uh, in any event, Judge Friedman, unlike all the other judges, was not willing to decide the case on what we call the papers. I mean, we simply made a legal argument. State can't come up with any good reason. He said, I will give the state the opportunity to come up with a justification for refusing to allow a opposite sex, a same-sex couple to marry. The justification that the state was using was that children do children thrive better if they grow up in a household with a mommy and a daddy, as opposed to two mommies or two daddies. Now, all of the social science research refutes that. What children need are competent and loving parents. It doesn't matter whether they're same sex or opposite sex. It's who they are, how well they parent. Uh, we know that sexual orientation is just that. But for many years, and this includes the American Psychiatric Association, considered that sexual, that homosexuality, as they called it, gay, was abnormal. It wasn't the normal thing to do. They considered it to be deviant. And that had a lot to do with prejudice against gay and lesbian people. But that's long been repudiated. We understand that it's a matter of orientation. People sometimes have to realize what their orientation is. Operating in a society with a long history of discrimination against gay and lesbian persons, some young people have a hard time to you, saying, this is who I am. But we know that it's a matter of orientation. And we also know that all the social science studies show that children do the same regardless of the sexual orientation of their parents. But so Judge Friedman wanted a hearing and we put on the, the, all the experts. There was a conservative group that recruited a couple of experts to try to refute the notion that children do as well when they're parented by same-sex couples as they do with opposite-sex couples. If you've done anything about social research, you know that in order for research to be valid, it has to compare two things that are similar, like apples and apples. Well, here was the comparison this group made. One group were children who were raised in a, quote, stable, opposite-sex family. The other group were children whose mother had had a same-sex relationship, period. Now, most of these children had come from divorced heterosexual homes. Uh, the, it was such so bad, this testimony. This is a professor, a sociology professor of Texas, that the day he gave his testimony, his department chair issued a public statement saying, uh, Dr. Echeneris has the right to uh, say whatever he wants, but his research is neither conceptually nor methodologically sound. Can you imagine what it's like to have your department chair debunk your research? And so when Judge Friedman uh, made his decision, I mean, he basically said that this testimony represents a fringe viewpoint that is rejected by the vast majority of their colleagues across a variety of social science fields. And there's no credible evidence showing that children raised by same-sex couples fare worse than those raised by heterosexual couples. That was relevant to Judge, Fr Judge Friedman's decision, but it wasn't relevant elsewhere. In the Sixth Circuit, these are the four cases coming from uh, Kentucky, Michigan, Tennessee, and Ohio that are in the United States Court of Appeals before the, uh, for the Sixth Circuit, there were two conservative judges and one liberal judge. Judges tended to rule on these cases based on their ideology. And the two, they held two to one, the state can allow only marriage between opposite sex couples. That's traditional and that's a rational thing for the state to do. So the case went up to the Supreme Court. There were four of them. Why is it reported Obergefell versus Hodges instead of the board versus Snyder? 
Well, the way the Supreme Court reports the case is in the order in which the petitions for review were filed. <laughs> and the Ohio case with Obergefell got up there a few days before DeBoer. Nonetheless, uh, the, the, we consider it in Michigan DeBoer versus Snyder. It was a five to four decision with the opinion written by Justice Kennedy. During the litigation, we both, we argued two constitutional grounds. That marriage, which has always been treated as a fundamental right for an opposite sex couple, should also be a right for a same sex couple. And then we argued with the Equal Protection Clause that it's unconstitutionally discriminatory to deny same-sex couples the benefit of marriage that we give to opposite-sex couples. In his opinion, Justice Kennedy said there are four principles and traditions that demonstrate that the reasons marriage is fundamental under the Constitution apply with equal force to same-sex couples. One, the right to personal choice regarding marriage is inherent in the concept of individual autonomy. People have a right to marry. People have a right to not marry. It is a choice, a very important choice. Secondly, the right to marry is fundamental because it supports a two-person union unlike any other in its importance to the committed individuals. The day the decision came down, there was a gathering in Ann Arbor at a popular place where gay and lesbian people gather. Uh, many people were there with their supporters. I got there in time for the press conference. And they had erected a, an arch, a marriage arch, and a minister was performing weddings. The first wedding that he performed was between two men. As after he performed the wedding, and they were now married, they literally leaped into the air because they could now say, we are married. If you, you've attended weddings, they are happy, joyous events. Uh, and so that's why we say that this two-person union is unlike any other in its importance to the committed individuals. Number three, marriage safeguards children and families and thus draws meaning from related rights of childbearing, procreation, and education. Throughout the litigation, we showed all the, the legal, financial, social, psychological harm that is caused to same-sex couples and their children by denying them the legal recognition of marriage. For, he said, marriage is the keystone of our social order. We re life revolves around marriage. Many, many people are married. And even when marriages break up, as unfortunately too many do, it's not that the people don't believe in marriage. They want a good marriage. They find that their own marriage is not a good one. Very often, they remarry, hoping for a better, better choice the second time around. And he says that the amendment's guarantee of equal protection of the laws also conveys the right of same-sex couples to marry. He says, we put together marriage as a fundamental right, equality, and he put it together same-sex couples have a right to marry. That's the history of marriage equality. It is as simple as that. Four justices dissented. And basically, I would just say, if you read the dissent, you say, you think, well, the voters of Michigan voted to, as the states are, voted to limit marriage to a man and a woman. That's the traditional meaning of marriage. If same-sex couples are unhappy, let them change it through the state constitutions. And what about people that have religious objections to same-sex marriage? You're going to marginalize them. No one will take their religious objections any, 
And people have religion, religious objections to many, many things. It's, it seems a strange argument that we shouldn't recognize one set of rights because religious people might feel marginalized if we do. You know, I was at the Supreme Court for the argument, uh, and uh, the courtroom was crowded. Uh, but listening to the argument, it honestly looked like it was war. I mean, it's like the justices knew how it was going to come out. There were going to be five votes to say the bans are unconstitutional and four dissenting votes. And that's the way it was. So marriage is now the supreme law of the land. Everybody has a right to marry the person of his or her choice, whether it's one is interracial, whether it's interreligious, whether it's same sex, whether it's opposite sex. Uh, and so now, regardless of one's sexual orientation, your parents can hound you at some point in your life. Why aren't you married yet? You wouldn't be able to do that if children were gay or lesbian. Now we have full equality, and parents can hassle all their children about getting married. Uh, but really, you know, my, my own experience in litigating this case over a four-year period and doing a lot of talking about marriage, I thought, I thought I said to my wife, Cotton, really made me appreciate our own marriage more. We've been married now for 55 years. We belong to that generation of people who got married in their 20s, and I know it's hard for your generation to understand, but as one of my colleagues put it, we're that generation that got married because they wanted to sleep together, and you had to be married to sleep together, so uh, that explains it. But really, it, um, there are just so many things that one takes for granted in being married. And the one that motivated April and Jane to do this, they wanted to both be parents to their children. Uh, I'm going to just take my one more comment. I want to open this up for questions. This is only the beginning. We have a long way to go before we achieve full equality for, for gay and lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. There's only 22 states that have laws prohibiting LGBT discrimination. Michigan is not one of them. Some of our communities, like Detroit and Ann Arbor, south of where I live, do have local ordinances, but there's no statewide law. Uh, my, D Dana Nessel, my former student, who I'm pleased to say was voted the Women's Lawyer of the Year uh, by Michigan uh, Lawyers Weekly, approach me about can we, how do we try to get about full equality. Here is what we are working on. You know, the United States Constitution is very difficult to amend, virtually impossible. Two-thirds vote of both houses, ratification by three-fourths of the states. The Michigan Constitution is at the other end of the spectrum. It is a people's constitution. It is very close to the people. For those of you who vote, and I hope you do, there are often proposed amendments. You can get an amendment to the Constitution on the ballot by a certain number of signatures, and then it is a majority vote. There is, in Article I, Section 2 of the Michigan Constitution of 1963, there is an Equal Protection Clause there is also a non-discrimination clause. The provision reads, no, I want to get this read, no person shall be denied the equal protection of her, the laws, nor shall any person be denied the enjoyment of his, and that word is careful, his civil or political rights, or be discriminated against in the exercise thereof because of religion, race, color, or national origin. Why those four? Because in 1963, this was the discrimination that we were aware of, that we were conscious about, that was being challenged in the courts. Racial and related national origin discrimination. 
Well, you might ask, what about gender? There was a story that it's told to me by, and I wasn't here at the time, of course, but by a now deceased law professor who was the chair of the, or vice chair of the commission of the Civil Rights Committee. He wanted to include gender. This is as early as 1963. There weren't very many women delegates to the Constitutional Convention. But those who were there objected to including gender, saying that would take away laws that give, quote, special protection to women. So gender was not included. The proposal is to, in a sense, update this provision by adding, by changing it, no one shall be, nor shall any person be denied the enjoyment of his or her civil or political rights or be discriminated against in the exercise thereof because of religion, race, color, sex, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or national origin provides that the legislature shall implement the section, but now, as we also add, when used in the laws of this state, prohibiting discriminatory practices based on sex, race, and others, the term sex shall be construed to include sexual orientation and gender identity. So that basically, there would be a constitutional commitment to full equality on the basis of race, religion, color, national order, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, and existing laws would be brought up to date, no need to have the legislature go through it again, to prohibit discrimination on that basis. That is my idea. It's been worked over by some other people who are in agreement. Hopefully efforts will be made get enough signatures, and put this on the ballot in 2016. Well, I've talked pretty long, but I carefully watch my, uh, take a look at my watch to make sure that we leave some time for you to have questions and comments, and we have. It's now your turn. Yes. So following the recent election in Houston, um, going forward from here, uh, getting the signatures, putting such an amendment on the ballot, uh, and then getting it passed, how do you, in terms of public relations, go Deal with up the party against problem. the... What? Deal with what we call the party problem, correct? Yeah, how do we deal with the, with the no, no men in the bathroom? Okay. bathroom? Now, uh, one of the things about being old, one of the things that I tell my students is that for what other people is a matter of history, is for me a contemporary event. Historians will tell you that history repeats itself. In 1971, when the Equal Rights Amendment was proposed, and it was never ratified, it couldn't get the 38 uh, states to ratify it. Opponents said, this will cause sexually integrated restaurants. And so the specter of men and women using the same restroom was used as an argument against the equal rights. But of course, most of us use sexually integrated restrooms. It's called our home. Uh, nonetheless, the, the potty problem surfaced. Uh, we have sex segregated restrooms, although I understand, I see more and more places are going to unisex because it is convenient. Look how the present system of sex-segregated restrooms discriminate against women. You see long lines in front of women's restrooms uh, while the men use uh, men's restrooms. No, uh, this would not mean that the women can choose to go into the men's restroom. We still have sex-segregated restrooms. Does that answer your question? No, of course not. Uh, Opponents of equality try to pick what they consider the most vulnerable. Similarly, when there was prejudice against gay and lesbians, it was argued that gay men are sexual predators, that they 
uh, are predators on young boys? The answer about restrooms is as I just said. Men go to men's restrooms, women go to women's restrooms. Now if a man wants to sneak in to a woman's restroom, he, no, I can't see why, he could put on a wig, put on a dress, and sneak in. This has nothing to do with transgender people using the restroom of their choice. And basically, this argument caught the proponents of the Houston Ordinance by surprise. It was a fear-type argument. How do you counter it? You counter it by saying, this doesn't change the rule. Women use women's restrooms. Men use, rest rest uh, use men's restrooms. Transgender women use women's restroom, and transgendered men use men's restroom. Does that satisfy? Or is there still? It satisfies me, but it didn't satisfy a whole bunch of voters. I mean, well, you, you, I did, I'm dreading the, the ads. That I'm well, to this, see. you know, again, you saw the ads that came up in 2004 for the Michigan Marriage Amendment. That uh, uh, if you don't, that uh, you're going to, people are going to uh, have, we're going to have polygamy, we're going to have all those things. There's no way that you can counter the opposition, in my opinion, except by the truth. And the ads are no. The response to the ads is transgendered women go into women's restroom, transgendered men go into men's restroom. Now, let me get very, very specific about the argument. Transgender, changing genders, is a process. Most of the gender change is like Caitlyn Jenner, Caitlyn Jenner, where a man changes into a woman. In the early stages of this, the woman will be taking hormones, which, try, which make her look more like a woman, remove the body hair that men typically have, more so than women, and over a period of time will enable her to develop breasts. Some women, I use my term very carefully, some women uh, choose uh, to have the reassignment surgery, which means that the penis is removed and replaced with a vagina. I understand it is possible scientifically to create a penis for women who are transgender. It's difficult, but they'll take their word for it, so to speak. And so what we're really talking about, and I think it's going to be hard for the opponents to actually use that term, what really bothers them is the idea of a woman who has not had the sex reassignment surgery going into the woman's restroom with the penis instead of the vagina. I don't think they're going to take ads saying that. But of course the answer is not a problem in women's restrooms since everybody uses a stall. That's one of the reasons why we have such a long delay. Uh, it's a tragedy. You know, some men lose the penis because of illness or because of accident. Their gender identity is still male and they will still be going into men's rooms even though they can't use the urinal. So if we really want to get specific about it, we can say that transgendered women use the women's restroom. And all the women are behind a stall, so no one's going to observe anyone. Now you have, as long as we're right, you can get, you have a problem, it's more than a problem with school children, with middle school and high school students. Who, who come out with transgender. And that is a little more complex. The answer is school, we rely on school authorities to use a degree of discretion to accommodate these. But that's not going to be the, the main attack. I think you're right. One line of attack is going to be on transgender, that we're going to have uh, male predators uh, going into women's bathrooms. And the answer, they can do that now. This won't have any effect on that. The other one is going to be a religious thing, uh, the right of people to discriminate uh, against same-sex couples when it comes to uh, the marriage and other things like that. Uh, it's going to, I mean, here's the dilemma. 
You either try to, you know, we saw the same dilemma when it came to civil rights law. Some of us are old enough to remember the arguments that were made against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I mean, either racial minorities stayed in the background and were discriminated against or had to fight the racism. The same is true if we're trying to achieve LGBT equality. No. Can you talk on a broader basis about the sort of fundamental societal misunderstanding of what the law is supposed to be? It seems that the opponents of uh, gender equality in marriage would argue that the law is meant to preserve the fundamental majority morality of the nation. Uh, on the other hand, people who are reacting with shock to some decisions seem to deride the law as being only there to protect the rights of minorities. Well, the answer is that we have majority rule subject to certain limitations. That's the whole idea of a constitutional democracy, that Yes, majority rule is the norm. The overwhelming number of laws are never subject to constitutional challenge. But we have a Bill of Rights, we have an Equal Protection Clause, and we also protect minority rights. That is our constitutional system, and we're always trying to find the right balance 